So, thank you for hanging on. Uh, we're on the graveyard shift well and truly here. Um, so, welcome to this presentation on VI scripting. Uh, I'm Chris Roebuck. I'm a certified LabVIEW architect, LabVIEW champion, but more importantly, I am a, uh, a strong supporter of the LabVIEW community. I think it's the community that really does make this uh, just a great environment to work within. Uh, there's a lot of sharing, there's a lot of collaboration, cooperation, and I think it's to be encouraged. So uh, no, no corporate sales pitch or anything like that. This is really kind of aimed at the community, this track today. So uh, I want to keep that theme going, hence the, uh, the lava t-shirt. So, so I'm going to share. You want me to start Hello, again? Chrissy. No, 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 no. A little bit of an introduction to myself, if, uh, if you don't know me. Uh, I'm a physicist by trade. Uh, LabVIEW was my first programming language back in 1994. I was a uh, physics undergraduate at Sheffield Hallam University, and uh, somebody gave me an impedance analyzer and a box of C++ and a box of LabVIEW 3, and said, make one of these, do something with that. So I tried C++. After about two weeks, my head was hurting quite a lot, so I tried LabVIEW, and it's kind of stuck ever since. Uh, and it's been a major component of my career ever since. I've worked in contract manufacturing, uh, the space industry. Uh, I've been an alliance partner. I've worked with two alliance partner companies. Uh, been a certified architect since 2008. Uh, I became a LabVIEW champion in 2013. Champion's really just about giving something back to the community and encouraging the community rather than a, any kind of proficiency or anything like that. Uh, and I'm a, I'm a regular attendee at C-Slug. I think, like I said, the community is everything uh, in this industry, and I think it's uh, it's fantastic. So it's good to see this community track uh, being so popular and s well supported. I've also got a certification that a lot of other people don't have. I'm a certified LabVIEW geek. I do it in my spare time. It's pretty sad, really. That was actually a birthday cake from a few years ago. So, <laughs> so do you want to find your birthday cake so that you threaten me? I've never seen a slightly birthday cake before. I, I, I love the fact that they got B-U-C-K in uppercase. I mean, they pay attention to detail that I really love about this. But before we get on to scripting, I want to say, you know, it is all about the, the LabVIEW community. Uh, there are some fantastic people. Everybody is so approachable. And... You, know, you go to these user groups and there are people that you've read about on the forums, there are people that have you know, written books on the subject, and the fantastic thing is everybody's in, in approachable, everybody is willing to share, so 
The guy on the right is Brian Powell. He was part of the LabVIEW 1 team. The guy on the left is Darren Nattinger. He created LabVIEW scripting, quick drop, and everybody just wants to share their experience. And I think it's fantastic. Um, father of LabVIEW, uh, and it, I think it's fantastic you get to meet these people. You might recognize the old person in the room from some of these pictures. Uh, some people that you might not recognize. Yeah, reprobates. And then, oh, and, and then there's me. Oh, there's a story behind that. So there's a certain common thread to most pictures that have me and Stephen. Then, so. <laughs> so without further ado, let's, let's, let's talk about what you've come here to listen to today. Let's talk about VI scripting. So a little bit of history about VI scripting first. It was accidentally exposed. It wasn't a planned feature release when it was actually exposed to the community. Actually, a file that was in LabVIEW 7 was left unlocked, and it had some property nodes on the block diagram that everybody looked at and said, hmm, that's interesting. We don't recognize these. Uh, and it had been inadvertently left unlocked. And it was exposed via a secret INI token in the LabVIEW INI file. And somehow, the knowledge of this INI token spread throughout the community. I can't think how <laughs> that <laughs> happened. <laughs> so, super private scripting features visible equals true. Um, that's, if you know that, that's, that's the mark that you've, you've been around for a little while in the LabVIEW community. So, ooh, sorry, if there's any weird graphical glitches, my graphics card is well and truly on its way out, so apologies. So, what is LabVIEW scripting? Well, LabVIEW scripting provides a method of using LabVIEW code to programmatically generate and or inspect LabVIEW code. So LabVIEW to create LabVIEW. And it adds properties and methods to the LabVIEW VI server hierarchy. So it allows us to operate upon other LabVIEW block diagrams and other LabVIEW front panels. So how to enable it. If anybody is using one of these versions of LabVIEW, don't raise up your hand because that's quite embarrassing, but you need to add that to your INI file in order to activate scripting. Do I have one? Should you use that one? Really? Yeah. Since LabVIEW, <laughs> since LabVIEW 2010, it, it can now be activated via the tools options window and you need to go down to the VI server and tick this little box that says show scripting functions in my toolbar. It is disabled by default, so you need to actually go in and enable it. Uh, just make sure you, you know the reasons why you're ticking that box. Are you going to do a caveat? A safety caveat? Oh, I'm going to do a safety caveat. <laughs> okay. So, again, what is it? Well, on the left, we've got an example of the, uh, the VI properties, uh, the properties that are available to the VI uh, class within LabVIEW when you have scripting disabled. And on the right is the same list populated when that tick box or the INI file has been put in place or the tick box has been selected. And you can see there are a few additional properties in there. One of which is highlighted in red and that's kind of the, the, the key to it all really, which is the block diagram property we now have the ability to open a reference to a block diagram using a property node. Okay, So that's the, that's the change that you will see. You won't see my menu bar zoomed in ridiculously. So why on earth would we want to do any of this? What, why, why would we want to create, write LabVIEW to create LabVIEW? Why would we want to write LabVIEW to inspect LabVIEW? I've got eyes, I can do that. Oh my goodness. Um, well extend the LabVIEW platform, extend the environment. A lot of the tools that we're now seeing in newer versions of LabVIEW since like 2010, 2011, are actually written using the scripting API. So something like QuickDrop, for example, allows us to start typing in the name of the VI we're looking for and drop it onto the block diagram. That's entirely written in LabVIEW code. It's LabVIEW code calling the scripting properties to drop those VIs onto the block diagram. And there are other tools too, VI Analyzer, for example, and we'll be covering that specifically a little bit later on. Improve your efficiency. If there's repetitive tasks that you're performing constantly in LabVIEW, it makes sense to automate them through the use of scripting. If there's things that you're constantly performing in LabVIEW, then chances are there's a scripting API method or property that will allow you to automate that. And that, in turn, reduces errors. Any time we can automate a repetitive task, it reduces the chance of introducing variation 
and it, it allows us to reduce errors. It allows us to standardize code development. If we have these automated tools for generating code, then we can standardize how our, org how our organization develops LabVIEW code. And you can become a scripting ninja, and there's even a special t-shirt you can buy on the internet that says scripting ninja on it, so that's cool as well. I told you, I'm sorry. Why should I be careful? Scripting is a fully supported feature, kind of. If you, chances are, if you run into a problem with scripting, you can get help on one of the forums, perhaps ni.com forward slash community or whatever the URL is these days, since it all changed. Um, Steve can tell you what that is, I'm sure. Um, Just you can get help from the community. Chances are, though, if, you, if you're seeing some weird behavior and you call into NI in the UK or one of the other offices, it's going to get escalated before you get any support. Uh, the scripting features are operating on the LabVIEW IDE itself, and getting first-line support might take a little bit of extra time because generally they'll get referred to somebody like Darren Nattinger who implemented the feature in the first place. So be aware of the, the kind of the time delay that might apply if you need support. Scripting only works in the development environment, not in the runtime. It's a development environment productivity enabler, if you will. It allows you to extend that development environment. It's not intended to be deployed as part of a build executable or anything like that. It only works in the runtime. Scripting documentation can be patchy. Whew, yeah, and you need a translator to understand what some of it was intended. It, it's, it's, it's patchy at best. Uh, depending on which version of LabVIEW you're using, it might be non-existent. Uh, even after it became a feature, early versions of the scripting documentation were, were not great. And the, the methods and properties of the LabVIEW scripting API do still change from one version to another. It tends to be additions, but occasionally the arguments of some of the methods within that API do change. So a little bit of caution needs to be um, kind of taken there, just, to be, just things to be aware of. From this point onwards, I should say, this presentation is very demo heavy. Be lazy. Um, and I'm going to go through some of these use cases that I talked about here, about how and why scripting might help you in your kind of day-to-day -day job. So where do we start? Well, that's, that's kind of the key to the kingdom, the, uh, the, that particular uh, property node there. It allows us to pass a VI ref num and obtain a reference to the block diagram of that particular VI. We can then, using that reference, start to act upon that, that, that reference using other properties and methods. So now we've got a reference to the block diagram of, the, uh, of interest, we can start to act upon it and invoke behaviors upon it. So the first demo that we're going to do is we're going to add an object to a LabVIEW block diagram. So when we've ticked that box or we've added that INI token, we've actually got a new palette, and I'll show you that in a second, but we've got a new palette that's added to our LabVIEW environment or enabled within our LabVIEW environment that enables us to drop some additional VIs. And they're highlighted, the scripting VIs and the properties have got this kind of turquoise color to them rather than the default yellow that we're used to seeing. So one of the VIs that we have is the new VI object, uh, sub VI, it's on the palette, we can drop it down. And when we run that VI, it creates a new VI and returns a reference to that newly created VI. Using that reference, we can then set some behaviors on that VI. So I'm using the, uh, the front panel window bounds, the, the block diagram window open state, um, and the size. And I'm actually sizing and positioning the front panel and the block diagram of the VI that I've just created. And then on the right hand side, the other turquoise VI is the new G object. VI. Again, that's also on the palette, and it allows us to add a new object to a LabVIEW block diagram. So the reference going into it on the top left-hand side, if I my mouse, my mouse going to work? No. Uh, the reference coming in from the VI, that's the owning object. So I'm wanting to add a new object to a VI. And the object that I'm going to add is the subtract function. And I can specify where I want to put it, and I'm dropping a subtract function. So that's all I'm going to do there. So let's take a quick look at that one. Oh, thank you. Beautiful resolution right there. This is going to be interesting. So here we've got that VI. Let's take a look just to see the block diagram is exactly the same. So we've got obtain a reference to a new VI. 
setting the size of the new VR window, show the block diagram, and then we're going to create a new object on the open block diagram, and we're going to create a subtract function. So if I go and run that, we've got a new VI, and we've added a subtract primitive to our LabVIEW block diagram. So we could, just to show that it's not the cooking show example, here's one I prepared earlier. Let's change that. Let's change it to an addition. Close that. Run it again. And there's our addition function. So without too much coding, we've added our first item, our first object, to a LabVIEW block diagram. OK, Chris, that's, that's, that's wonderful. But how many VIs do you know just have one primitive on the block diagram? that, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add a nested object. So typically, we have objects within other objects. For example, primitives within a for loop, items within an event structure, items within a case structure. So we've got the same construct again. We're obtaining a reference to a new VI. We're setting the front panel bounds, the front panel window position, and then we're adding an item to the block diagram. The first item we're going to add is a while loop. So I'm adding a while loop, and notice this time, after I've added the while loop, sorry, I'm adding my add primitive, but that input wire is no longer the VI reference, it's the output reference of my while loop object. It is the owner of my add primitive. So we've almost got this hierarchy now, this nesting within the, within the construct here. So I'm creating a while loop, and then I'm going to create something within that while loop. So let's have a look at that and see what that looks like. Adding a nested object. So, same bit of code here. I'm going to go out there, add a while loop, and put the add inside it. <coughs> and run that. And we've now got our while loop with our add inside it. Obviously, if I'd gone ahead and not wired that, but I actually don't want to do that one. If I actually went ahead and made the, the VI, the owner, the add, and this time it's actually outside the while loop. Okay, the owner of the addition um, was, the, uh, was the VI, not the while loop. Okay, I just didn't alter its positioning to make it. So we're starting to create objects on a block diagram and create some complexity to our, uh, to our hierarchy. So we've added a nested object. We might want to inspect a VI. We might want to actually look at what's in it. And rather than build a VI, we might want to actually look at what's already inside that VI and start to categorize what's there. And in order to do that, we need to do something called traversing the hierarchy. So I've talked about the block diagram being a hierarchy of objects. If you've got something like a case structure or a loop or a multi-frame sequence, then there will be objects within that. So we need a way to traverse that entire hierarchy and drill down until we've catalogued every item. So in this particular example, we are obtaining a reference to the diagram, and we've got the all objects, uh, the uh, all objects property that returns everything, everything that's on the block diagram. But there's also this sub VI that's on the palette, which is called traverse, traverse, traverse. It's called traverse, and there might be some other words at either at either side of that word. <laughs> Come on, Chris, I know you know off by heart. I know. I'm so, Jesus. Traverse, traverse VI hierarchy. Yeah, and that would be worked. <laughs> Doesn't make you a better person. <laughs> So traverse VI hierarchy, we're passing it the reference to the <coughs> VI, we're telling it that we're interested in BD, block diagram, and it allows us to filter by particular, <coughs> by particular objects on a block diagram by their name. So in this case, I want to return all of the references to for loops on my block diagram. Or on the other one, I want to return all of the references to G objects, i.e. everything, on my block diagram, and then I'm going to return the name of those objects. Let's have a look at So that's the name of the type, not the name you've given. 
that is the name of the that is the name of the class. Okay, so I've got, a, I've got a VI here that's got some random stuff thrown down on the block diagram, okay? And sorry about the resolution and the scaling, but I've got a VI, that, the same block diagram that you've just seen, that's gonna traverse that VI and get me a list of all of the objects and all of the G objects and all of the objects within the for loop and return them in three list boxes. So if we run that, we can see all objects, there's a digital numerical constant, a sub-VI, a function, a sequence structure. Wonderfully, tell, telling me what's in that. Uh, we could drop something else down, so let's go ahead and drop down an event structure down there just to see what effect that has. Save that, we run it again, and now we've got an event structure that is identified. So we can now traverse the hierarchy of our block diagram <laughs> and just see what's there, okay? Still not. Still not fantastic, right? We can create simple VIs and we can create, or oh, we can create complex VIs, but it take a lot of code to do it. Um, so, what's next? What do we do when we've gone from here? Well, we might want to get selected objects. We might want to just highlight certain objects on a block diagram or a front panel and just get access to those objects. How do we know what the, what the user is selecting? Let's add another quick. I told you it was demo heavy, sorry. Apologies. So this is how the right click toolkit works, actually. So this enables an awful lot of functionality because if you think about it, we've got the ability to create code, we've got the ability to inspect code. If we can just select certain items on the block diagram on the front panel and be able to filter on those selected items and then create or add code based on our selection or inspect based on our selection, then we're starting to get some functionality, some powerful functionality here. So. Here I've got a VI. Um, actually, that was where's four? Where's four? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Demo four. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so demo four. I've got a VI here. It's got some stuff on its front panel. It's also got some stuff on its block diagram as well, just to see what's going down. I'll make all these demos <coughs> available and I'll upload them to the presentation so you can play around in your own time. So if I select some items on the front panel and then run my VI, it told me that I'd selected a string, a Boolean, and a numeric. Let's just select, sorry, a cluster. Um, let's go ahead and run it again. We just selected the cluster this time. Okay, and if I go ahead and select the numeric. So I'm able to identify what's been selected by the user, and that same bit of code that I'll show you in a second can also act upon the block diagram. So this time, let's get to oh, Chris, get <laughs> Thank you, high DPI monitors. Right, select a couple of items, and now we've got a random number and a Boolean that's been selected. Okay, so we've got the ability to select item, uh, identify what items have been selected by our user. Let's take a little look at that block, at that code, just to quickly see what is involved in that. So, pretty straightforward actually. We've got a reference to a VI, and we, we're opening a reference to its panel and its block diagram, and then we're using the selection list property of both the panel and the block diagram, building an array of those items, and then there's a, another VI that's on the block diagram that tells us the name of the item, tells us the label of the item based on its reference. So we build an array of everything on the front panel that's been selected and everything on the block diagram that's been selected and return the name. That's pretty straightforward. It, the block diagram one is obviously a scripting VI. The panel one is available to you even if you don't have scripting enabled. Now, what's next? We're starting to get somewhere now. So we've got, we've got some tools for selecting objects. Oh, this one's fun. This one's got absolutely no relevance, but just to show you the things you could do about enforcing style or annoying colleagues. Um, <laughs> let's have a look at demo five, demo five, demo five. Okay, so I've got a VI here that's got a block diagram, and this, I should say this isn't, this code was created by one of the Lava Forum people, uh, but I thought it was interesting, and it gives you kind of a good, a good example of the sorts of things you can do. So, not that one. Demo 
Okay, so this time we've got a VR that can set the color of alternating block diagram objects and structures based on their level of nesting. So you might, if you've got something like a for loop that's sat on a white background, sometimes I like to differentiate between what's in different cases or what's at <coughs> different structures so you can kind of visualize the hierarchy a little bit more. So let's, let's pick something not horrifically offensive. Uh, <laughs> let's go ahead and run that. And there's our block diagram recolored based on alternate objects within the hierarchy. Uh, so you could really annoy all your work colleagues by setting everything to be white or <laughs> everything to be transparent. And it, you could do it with the objects themselves as well. Some objects can be recolored, like sequence structures, for example. There's no edit on that either. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> 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 You've got to make sure you save it as well. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so that's, you can have some fun with these things. Um, so that's adding some color. How are we doing on time? I don't want to interrupt everybody. So now we've got a way of selecting, we've got a way of inspecting code, and we've got a way of, I want to see what he holds up, he's going to hold up something offensive. <laughs> oh, I'm modified, yeah. We've got a way of inspecting, a way of selecting, and a way of generating code using our scripting. So we've now got technique, we've now got tools whereby we can extend the LabVIEW platform. So one such tool that ships with LabVIEW but allows you to extend it even further is QuickDraw. QuickDraw pull, who's using QuickDraw? Okay, that's pretty good, that's pretty good. If you're not, then you're not writing LabVIEW as quickly as you could. Um, <laughs> yeah, your money. Um, so, QuickDraw. We can write our own tools to plug into QuickDraw to aid our efficiency, to make certain tasks within LabVIEW uh, faster and more efficient and done correctly and done the same every time we do it. Um, that, that's got to be a good thing, right? So let's take a look at a quick drop uh, example. So is everybody using, any, anybody using any custom quick drop plugins at all? Oh, okay. Okay. So does anybody use quick drop shortcuts? Just the regular shortcuts? Oh, okay. So <coughs> quick drop. As you know, control S, uh, sorry, control space, control shift space on a Mac, um, and control, oh, for goodness sake. So we uh, control space, quick drop pops up, and we can start typing, and it tells us the name of the function or whatever it is we want to do, and we can just drop it down. But we can add into that functionality plugins to do custom behaviors. For example, how annoying is it when you've written this cascading chain of visa calls and I think, actually I want to test this, I want to I run this code again but I don't want to do the reset before I set the output state. So I want to re remove that call to visa right and, and rewire it quickly, but I'm, I don't, it, don't want to break wires and things. So I can just simply do control space, control R, and it removes it and rewires all of the inputs and outputs to that sub VI. So that's a lot quicker and less error prone. Okay. So that's, that's, that's the context right click menu now as well. That particular one to remove new wire. If so they have. <laughs> Ooh, I like it. I like that a lot. <laughs> but basically, you know, you need to be using quick drop, it's the fastest way. The pallets are no good. Okay. I know I know everybody remembers it based on where it is and not what it's called. <laughs> Really Hands up, who knows where the type, uh, where, where the colour box constant is? That thing moves <laughs> in <laughs> here. <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> don't, don't try and be like a normo and, uh, <laughs> and pretend you don't know where it is because <laughs> I saw you last year. <laughs> okay, so here's another little quick drop. OCD kicks in. I hate it when I've got a case structure and they're not in alphabetical order. Okay, <laughs> I, I like them to be sorted. I'm a bit funny like that. So. 
It is a little quick drop. It's available. There's a web page, Quick Drop Enthusiast. It's on NI, uh, the NI community page. <laughs> 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 And I'm looking for a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a case structure with a number of cases, and they're not in alphabetical order. So control space, control L. Oh, and now they're in alphabetical order. I prefer the in it at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> 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 need to add, need to add one. <laughs> if it's not a right <laughs> angle, it's a wrong angle. <laughs> so that's that's. Quick drop plugins, a quick drop enthusiast community page tells you how to build your own, where to put them in LabVIEW, how to package them up and distribute them, and there's about 50 uh, community submitted uh, plugins that other people have written. So there's some really cool tools that will make your life easier. Okay, so that's quick drop plugins. Final one I'm going to get a chance to cover today. There's some more stuff in the slides that you'll get to see if you download them. Extending the platform, VI Analyzer. Who's using VI Analyzer? Okay, so we all write perfect code and we don't need to check that there's any problems with it. Brilliant. So VI Analyzer is a tool, uh, ships with LabVIEW Pro now, I believe it's included in the package. I'm not from that sort of thing. And VI Analyzer allows you to inspect code and apply rules to that inspection uh, in order to kind of satisfy your own coding standards, some suggested coding standards from NI. But you can plug in your own uh, tests your own rules uh, against which your code will be judged and you can make some of those quite quite um, interactive and actually automate some of the checking and correction of the errors that you might find so where have we got seven VI analyzer okay so I've got a VI and it's got something that contravenes one of the rules um, within uh, what contravenes one of the rules that I don't, I don't like using uh, string constants in build path. Um, they, they can change and going between development environment and EXEs, uh, you can introduce issues in your code. It works fine in dev, you build it, that path's no longer correct for a build. So I like to check for things like that in code. Um, so VI Analyzer, let's go ahead and see what VI Analyzer can do. Identify. So VI Analyzer is using scripting to analyze the code. And I've built my own test to say, if you see this, kick, kick me at the backside because I shouldn't be writing code like that. So I've written a test and, 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 and some more. So let's go on VI Analyzer number seven. Um, next, let me get rid of all the NI sourced stuff. And I've got these Delacore style. So these are custom VI Analyzer tests that I've written. Um, they test for various things that I don't like. Um, and it, for example, well, we'll go on to that one in a second. But they <laughs> test for stuff. So let's go ahead and analyze my code. I don't want to say changes, analyze it, and it found something. It found that there was a problem. I was using the current VI's path. So it's inspected the code and checked for something that I like to not do. And it's telling me about it here. So I've got an opportunity to correct my code. But I might want VI Analyzer to do that for me. So let me get rid of that for a second. Yeah. So this VI, actually, this next VI, where is it? Where's my list? I don't remember where it is. There we go. This next VI has got one of my pet peeves. Tell, can anybody tell me what I don't like about that <laughs> one? <laughs> yeah, I don't like these. They take up. They took. They take up too much block diagram space, and worse still, they look a little bit like LabVIEW objects. <laughs> yeah, what? just one. <laughs> so, I like to not have these, and I like to be told if there's a VI that's with them, but and then I don't want to have to manually go through and do anything about it, so I've written a VI analyzer test that will fail <coughs> if the terminals are in icon view, and I can tick this box and say convert after review. So I can go through my code, look for stuff that I don't like, and <coughs> fix it. So let's go ahead and analyze again. So maybe I change this. Actually, let me see. I've just analyzed the wrong one, haven't I? <coughs> no. No. Tools. Yeah, analyzer. Analyze the eyes. Rubbish one. So, I'm not going to see it on the right, left, 
literally one minute. Oh. Right. Analyse. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, that's too much. Right, so this time. Your mm. reptile, shut. <laughs> Done my analysis. It detected that the icon view had contravened my rule, so my scripting god went in, looked at the code, and went, Is there anything on here that's an icon? Yep, bad. But it didn't fix it for me. I didn't tick it. <laughs> what a. organization which I'm sure it has as a style guide document and you want to check that everybody's following that everybody's writing the code the same way you can implement all of the comment all of the all of the rules within your style guide you can implement them using VI analyzer and you could have them be corrected or you could punish the person who's not following the style guide by having them correct so and I think I'm out of time uh, I will upload the presentation and all the demos uh, shortly, and uh, thank you for coming along. <laughs>